Welcome to lecture 26 of the course on high performance computing. In today's lecture, we start on the next item of our agenda. This is item number 6 where we talk about cache memory. I had given you a general introduction to this topic in the, towards the end of the previous lecture. Now, this topic is important to us from our discussion of pipelining and of processor architecture because we realized that in discussing how instructions could be executed, it was important to make a rather strong assumption that memory latencies would not be seen by the processor most of the time because the memory, main memory is so much slower than the processor. And we just uh, bypassed the problem by saying that there would be some hardware called cache memory which would solve that problem and make the assumption valid. It's now time to look into that assumption and how it is uh, realized in the hardware. So the cache memory is the name of the hardware that makes that assumption a, a reasonable assumption. And uh, as I had mentioned in the previous lecture, the design principle of cache memories is something that we have seen when we talked about virtual memory, the principle of locality of reference, of which there are the two aspects that it's important to understand. Temporal locality, which tells us that for typical program behavior, it is the least recently used entities, whether they be instructions or data, that are least likely to be referenced in the near future. Remember that it was important in the case of in our discussion of virtual memory the, in connection with page replacement policies to have some kind of an understanding of program behavior in the sense of what it is likely to do in the near future. So this principle gives us a, a model or an understanding of typical program behavior from that perspective. The second aspect of locality was that of spatial locality which leads us to understand that for typical programs the neighbors or neighboring memory locations to a location which is currently being referenced are the ones that are likely to be referenced in the near future. So the principles of temporal and spatial locality, which were of relevance when we talked about virtual memory, once again, being principles or models of how programs access their instructions or data, will also be relevant in our discussion of cache memory. Okay, now just to illustrate how cache memory exploits the principles of locality of reference, um, first of all, remember that cache is a hardware entity and it in some sense uh, provides what the processor wants directly rather than expecting the accesses to be satisfied out of the main memory which is slow and this will happen hopefully most of the time not necessarily all the time but most of the time at a very high speed so the picture we should have in mind is that the CPU as always sends requests to main memory for instructions or data in the form of an address and at some later point in time gets back the d piece of data or instruction. We now understand that there is this intermediate piece of hardware called the cache memory, which actually typically most of the time provides the instruction or the data at high speed. And I've shown the cache memory as being much smaller, significantly smaller than the main memory in this diagram. So the general principle of how caches operate, and we're blowing up that small green block into a, the larger block, is that when an address A is received by the cache hardware from the processor, remember that the processor sends an address to the cache memory as per this diagram. So when the address reaches the cache, obviously the cache must have some amount of very fast memory in order to be able to provide data or instructions in, in, in quickly. So there must be some fast memory inside the cache. But in addition, since clearly not all of the contents of main memory could be present in this small cache. There must be some hardware within the cache which can determine which instructions or data from main memory are currently inside the cache and inside the fast memory of the cache. And te technically what that hardware would have to do is, given the address A that the processor has requested, determine whether or not the, the contents of memory location A are currently inside the fast memory of the cache, which is what I label as do I have it logic. Once again, I'm using the term logic to refer to circuitry. So circuitry which can determine whether or not the address A is currently present inside the cache memory. And in order to determine whether or not address A is currently present inside the cache memory, the cache will obviously have to keep track of the addresses which are currently in or represented inside the cache memory by a table of some kind. And the technical terms for the fast memory, the do I have it logic, and the table of addresses that I have are cache RAM, lookup logic and cache directory. So the cache directory is a table which contains information about a hardware table which contains information about the current contents of the cache. In other words, 
which memory locations are currently available in the cache RAM. The cache RAM is the fast memory in which those instructions or data are uh, stored. And the lookup logic is the circuitry which checks whether the address A is present by, by referring to the cache directory. Subsequently, can provide instructions or the data if it is present out of the cache RAM. Now, I had given this indication that the cache is much smaller than main memory, which suggests that the amount of information that can be stored in the cache RAM is much smaller than the size of the main memory. And uh, a typical number for the, one of the kinds of caches we're going to look at is as little as 32 kilobytes. Remember that when we talk about main memories today, there would be a few gigabytes in size, which is thousands of times more than the size of, I mean, orders of magnitude, but definitely thousands of times larger than the size of this cache RAM. So this actually is of, of relevance to us in the discussion that is to follow. We should note that if at any given point in time, the cache RAM can contain only 32 kilobytes of instructions or data, given that the typical, in our MIPS-1 instruction set, the size of one instruction is four bytes, then the number of instructions which could be contained in the cache is about 8,000, 32 kilobytes divided by four bytes, which is about 8,000. And similarly, if I was storing integers, four-bit, four four-byte integers in the cache, then the number of four-byte integers which could be stored in the cache is a few thousands, about 8,000, if the size of the cache, is 30, of the cache RAM is 32 kilobytes. So in short, uh, from this we understand that the number of instructions or data that can be stored in such a cache is just a few thousands. In our current example, if I'm talking about four byte instructions or data and a 32 kilobyte cache RAM, then about 8,000 instructions or data. So numbers I describe as in the thousands, not in the hundreds of thousands, not in the millions, but in the thousands, a few thousands, which, uh, is, of, which, which is something we will use in the discussion that follows. Now we're going to start by concentrating on what the lookup logic does and how it might do it to give us an understanding of how the cache operates. So remember, the lookup logic is the circuitry within the cache itself, which given an address A, determines whether or not the entity represented by the address A is present inside the cache. And it does so by looking up among the addresses inside the cache directory. So the question which we need to get an answer to right away is, how do, can a, a, a a cache uh, lookup logic do the lookup fast. It's critical that the lookup be done fast because we want the entire operation of sending an address, the, the, the processor sends an address to the cache and subsequently the instruction or data goes back to the processor. We want all of that to happen in a very small amount of time. In our discussion of the processor, we were assuming that this would take about one clock cycle. In other words, maybe a nanosecond or a fraction of a nanosecond as opposed to main memory, which is going to take 100 nanoseconds to uh, provide a piece of data or instruction. Therefore, clearly the cache lookup itself must be much faster than that, much faster than the one nanosecond. So the question is, how can a fast lookup be done? Now this whole question of looking up is actually a specific instance of a more general problem called searching. And one learns about searching in an introductory computer science course on data structures. As essentially, in searching, one learns about different algorithms or techniques to search for a specific value from among a large collection of data. And uh, this is a frequently occurring problem both in the application development as well as we now see in hardware. Because there will be situations where searches, where a particular element has to be looked for in a large collection of elements. Uh, now the uh, kind of example which might be used in a data structures course might be to talk about searching in the context of Let's say you have a very large text file and you want to search for the word, a particular word, let's say the word phase in the large text file. And searching could be used for this. So this is a, a typical kind of an example. Or if I have a, a large integer array, I have an, I've written an application program in which there's a very large array of integers, 10,000, 100,000 integers, and I wish to determine whether or not the number 10, the integer 10 is present in the integer array, and if so, at which index, where in the array. So these are two examples of search problems, which as you can clearly see will occur for many different kinds of applications. Now our specific problem, search problem in, in the context of the cache lookup, remember we are talking about how to do fast cache lookup, is the address A has come to the cache and among all the addresses which are in the cache directory, the cache hardware has to determine whether or not the address A is present. 
And from our uh, calculation based on the typical size of a cache, we have determined that there could be a few thousands of addresses inside the cache directory. Not millions, not hundreds of thousands, but a few thousands. So this is the size of the problem, a few thousands. In our, in our particular cache example, it was about 8,000 based on our current calculation. But remember that our requirement is that this search should happen extremely fast. So we are trying to understand how search can be done quickly. And the requirement for speed comes from the fact that the entire cache operation starting from lookup and ending with the data reaching the processor is supposed to take about a nanosecond, about a clock cycle. Okay, so what are the different kinds of search algorithms that are conceivable? Now the, the simplest kind of search algorithm that you will hear about in uh, let us say a data structures course is something called linear search. And in linear search the picture that you should have in mind is one where there is let us say an array of, of integers let us say as in the second example which I had suggested, searching for the number 10, the integer 10 in a large array of integers. So I have this large array of integers and uh, the way that I could do a linear search is I am looking for the address A in this large array of integers. So I compare A with the first address in this array which in our context would be the cache directory. The, the, the index of the first address in the cache directory might be 0 as the convention that I will use is for arrays as in C the index of the first element will be 0, the index of the second element will be 1 and so on. So I start by comparing A, the address I am looking for, with the first element in the cache directory. And if I am lucky, they match. If so, the search is successful and I am done and the search has been extremely fast. But if I am unlucky, they do not match, they are not the same and I have to continue. So in linear search, what I do next is I compare A with the second address in the directory. In other words, the one whose index is 1 and so on. So I can continue doing this uh, until I have either been successful in finding A within the directory, maybe at location uh, 35. Alternatively, it is possible that I reach the end of the directory. In other words, I reach n minus, uh, the, if, if the size of the directory is n elements, then the last element in the directory would have an index of n minus 1. So if I reach the last address in the directory without having found a match along the way, then I know for a fact that the search was unsuccessful in the sense that the address A is not present in the directory and that is the end of the search. So the search either ends successfully or it ends unsuccessfully and either is okay. The cache hardware can be built to proceed depending on which of these is the case. So this is a possible way to set up um, a search. The problem with this particular technique, in other words linear search, is that if there are thousands of elements, thousands of addresses in the cache directory. In other words, in our example, n minus 1 could be 8000 and something, 8191 or something like that. Then in the worst case, this uh, the number of comparisons that would have to be made in this procedure of iteratively checking con consecutive elements of the cache directory could be a few thousands and these would have to be done one after the other. And therefore, this cannot be viewed as a fast operation, cannot be done quickly. Therefore, one should eliminate linear search as a possibility for our context, the context of doing fast cache lookup. Now, as an alternative to linear search, uh, a, a much faster search technique is something called binary search. And the idea in binary search is that once again, I have this array of values, my cache directory, let us say, but instead of just starting to search I start by ensuring or sorting the array of data items, say in increasing order. If the array is already in sorted order, then I need not do anything about it. But otherwise, I rearrange the elements of the array so that they are in increasing order. Let us say increasing from left to right, which means that the zeroth, the element with index 0 is the smallest value and the element with index n minus 1 is the largest value. That is what we mean by sorting in increasing order. It could alternatively be sorted in decreasing order. It does not really matter. Now, how do I proceed with the search for address A? I start by comparing A with not the first element, but with the middle element in the array. And if uh, n is odd, the middle element in the array will be n by 2, somewhere in the neighborhood of n by 2. So I compare A with the element at the middle of the array. And if they are the same, I am done. On the other hand, if they are not the same, then I, can, I could have determined f during the check of comparing A with the middle value whether A is less than or greater than the value at the middle of the array. 
And if A is less than the element at the middle of the array, then I know that my continued search for A can be restricted to the elements to the left or less than the uh, element at the middle of the array. On the other hand, if, if when I compared A with the middle value, the value x, I found that A was greater than x, then I could restrict my search to the upper half of the array, thereby eliminating half of the array from, con from consideration for subsequent uh, comparisons. Right, so, I could repeat the procedure that I have just described for the appropriate half of the array and what I mean by repeat is that suppose that I had determined that A was less than n by 2 or the element at n by 2 in other words x, then I could forget about all these elements. I just need to search among the other elements of the array and I could compare A with the element which is at the middle of that half of the array and so on. So, with each comparison I would be eliminating half of the elements that I have in contention for possible locations where the address A could be. So, very clearly this is going to be faster than linear search in the context of looking up in the, in the worst case and uh, not only that I could say that the, uh, it could take rather than thousands of comparisons it might just take tens of comparisons and technically the what I am talking about here is that it, it could take on the order of the logarithm of n base 2 which is in this case a few tens of comparisons. So, remember that linear search was taking thousands of comparisons which was definitely much too slow to be satisfactory for our hardware fast cache lookup. Binary search is taking only tens of comparisons which is faster I mean 100 times faster but uh, requires that the addresses be in sorted order which may be difficult for us to ensure we do not even know if that is going to be possible. But the tens of comparisons themselves may not be fast enough for the context that we are in and therefore once again unfortunately we may have a good technique much better than linear search but not good enough for our fast cache lookup. Basically what we need is some kind of a search technique that we will be able to do the search in a number of comparisons which is not related to the number of elements in the array. Remember that it looked like the linear search in the worst case was going to take uh, n number of comparisons whereas the case of binary search it looked like it was uh, logarithmic in, in, in n but we want something which is not dependent on n the number of elements in the array at all and one such technique is something known as hash searching. The property of hash searching is that it may in fact typically just take one comparison for the typically not in the best case but typically may just take one or two a small very small number of comparisons independent of n. Right. and uh, the number of comparisons required does not depend on the number of data values that we are searching among. So, this is clearly a much faster than the binary search technique and let me just explain how hash search works. The idea of hash search is in general hash, the, the hash search is frequently used so it is now available as a verb when talks about hashing and basically hashing is a search technique that uses a hash table, it uses a table and it indexes into the table using a hash function. So, the specific idea is that there is something called a hash function and the value which you are searching for will be, will be computed on by the hash function to generate an index which is used to look into the hash table at one specific location of the hash table. So, the hash function is a function which is computed on the search string the thing that you are searching for in the table. Let me just give you an example of how, how, this how this operates. For this example, I will use the first uh, search example that I had used earlier where I am searching for a particular word. Let us say I am searching for the word phase as I had mentioned earlier. So, over here I need to view the word phase not as the word but let us say as a string of characters just to generalize this. So, I will in general the, the elements which I am searching for are strings of characters let us say in general the string the string could be of length len, uh, len. So, len is the length of the string and I could talk about the individual characters of the string as being s sub 0, s sub 1 up to s sub len minus 1. So, in the case of phase this is a, a string of length 4 I am sorry string of length 5 and I have the elements p which is the 0 to s of 0, h which is s of 1 and so on. So, in general if you are searching for a string of length n and you wanted to come up with a hash function, you could, there are many possible hash functions 
I will just mention one, one, one particular hash function which is shown over here. You will notice what I am doing is I am first computing the sum of all the s sub i's. So, s sub i going from i equal to 0 up to i equals len minus 1. In other words, I just add up all the characters in the array, in the string. What does it mean to add up characters? Characters do not have values that can easily be summed if we view them as characters. We do not think of adding the character a to the character b. But knowing that the characters are likely to be represented in ASCII, you will recall the ASCII code which is an 8 bit code which is used for representing characters. We could actually do the summation of the characters by summing their ASCII values and the ASCII values are can be viewed as unsigned integers. So, an unsigned integer addition will give us a sum and then we could divide this by the length of the, the string, the string of characters. Right? So, in, in this particular example, I would add the ASCII value of P to the ASCII value of H, etc., adding to the ASCII value of E and then divide that by 5. And uh, then this, what I get would be an integer value, an unsigned integer value and uh, I would use this integer value to index into the hash table. So, the hash table itself is some kind of a table an array let us say in which these different strings that I have come across will be, ser will be, will be, uh, will be stored. So, for example, it is possible that the word phase is present in, in, in my the text that I am searching for in which case the word phase will be present in the hash table. Where will it be present in the hash table? It will be present in the hash table entry corresponding to the value that I had computed by summing the elements s sub 0, p plus h plus a plus s plus e dividing by 5 and I would find it in that element of the hash table. Now, what are the, I, over here I have written that the maximum, minimum and maximum value indices into the hash table might be 0 to 255 and you notice that this might be coming from the fact that I am assuming an 8 bit ASCII code, maybe extended ASCII in which the values can therefore go from 0 to 255. Hence, when I add all the values and divide by the number of values, I will get a value which is between 0 and 255. Now, by you, you can immediately see that if the value that I am looking for like phase is present inside the hash table. So, the, the way you should look at it is if you are looking in a large text file, then before you start searching for words, you would take the individual words from the text file and put them into the hash table by computing for each of the words, computing its hash value and then putting that word into the corresponding element in the hash table. Now, of course, this would lead to a small problem in that uh, very clearly, if I have only 256 elements in the hash table, then I can only have 256 distinct words remembered in the hash table. And uh, this could be readily seen from the fact that using the hash function which I have suggested, both the word phase and the word shape will have the same hash index because they have exactly the same characters in them, just in a different order. And therefore, when I sum the characters together, I will get the same sum. And when I divide by 5, I will get the same value for phase and shape and in fact a large number of other words which may have completely different alphabets may all hash to the same entry in the hash table and this could be a problem and this is in fact uh, what is called the hash table collision and the implementation of the hash table would have to uh, take care of collisions by ensuring that alternative locations in the hash table could be used or some such uh, mechanism. But in our context of the of the cache directory that may not be an issue in terms of the lookup speed. We may be able to handle collisions or collisions may not be a problem to us as far as the lookup speed is concerned. And therefore, from the perspective of speed of lookup, we must view the hash table as really being a search technique which will return tr uh, yes or no with this single comparison, just comparing the word that you are looking for with. So, you take the word that you are looking for, you compute its hash function you then index into the hash table and compare the word that you are looking for with the word inside the hash table and if they are the same with one comparison I get successful and if they were not the same then with one comparison I would say not successful if I assume that there are no collisions. Therefore, in some sense this is the fastest possible search technique and therefore this must be the one that is used for fast hardware uh, lookup which is the con in, in our context. So, we now understand that in order to do fast cache lookup the cache hardware must be using a hash function. Now, a hash function on what? In our cache situation, the cache lookup hardware is doing a search for an address A 
and therefore the hash function must be computed on the address A. Now a simple hash function would just be to select some of the bits of the address A rather than trying to add all of the bits of address A. If you add all the bits of address A, you will just end up with, if it is a 32 bit address, you will end up with a value which is uh, the, the sum of the ones or the number of ones in, in the address and that might not be a very meaningful hash function. So rather than that, it might be interesting to think of a hash function which, which computes a value based on just selecting some of the bits of the address A. Right. So the, the picture we could have in mind is, so I have the address A, I am showing you the address A in binary. Right? If the address A is 1000, then we think of it as the binary representation of 1000. We are talking about an address A which is sent from the processor to the cache and is therefore going to be sent in binary form. So we think of the address A in its binary form, least significant bit, its most significant bit. If it is a 32 bit address, the bits would go from 0 to 31. So the question that now is, in doing the fast cache lookup using a hash function, which bits could be used, which bits of the address could be used to do the fast cache lookup? In other words, which bits of the address define the hash function? Now there are a, a few possibilities. One possibility is that I could use the most significant bits of the address A. Another possibility is that I could use the least significant bits of the address A. And of course the third possibility is that I could use some of the intermediate bits of address A. Let us consider the two extreme possibilities and first. Right, so the first suggestion is that I could use the most significant bits of address A in order to do the lookup into the cache directory. Okay, now um, let us try to think about to what extent this is a good idea. Now consider your uh, typical program. So over here what I have drawn is I have drawn your program and its addresses go from 0 up to some maximum value, maybe 2 to the power of 32 minus 1, some maximum value. Now just consider the text part of your program. We understood that these are virtual addresses we are talking about. We understood that the text occurs in f from the way that we were drawing the memory image of a process. We understood that each process assumes that it starts with address 0, goes up to some maximum address, 2 power 32 minus 1. And the text, or the, the instructions, the code, the program part of, the, of this image occupies the early addresses. In other words, the program occupies addresses 1, 2, etc. Now if this is the case and I have uh, a medium sized program, then very clearly all of the instructions of my program will have the same most significant address bits. Right? If I consider uh, the, the two most significant address bits, then you should notice that everything in the first quarter of this address space will have the same two most significant address bits. Similarly, if my program is not is 32 kilobytes, 64 kilobytes or something like that, it will be the case that almost all of the instructions will have the same most significant, most significant address bits. The different instructions will differ in their least significant bits, but they will have most significant bits which are pretty much the same, very minor difference between the most significant bits depending on the size of the program. What this is going to mean is that from the perspective of instructions, pretty much all the instructions will have the same hash function if I use the most significant address bits as the hash function. Okay, what does that mean? It means that almost all the instructions will end up occupying the same entry in the cache directory, which means that there is going to be a lot of situations which we call collisions, which means that the cache cannot be too successful in uh, its operation as far as instructions are concerned. And you can stretch the same argument for the stack. Once again, the bulk of the stack is going to have the same address bits or for the data or for the heap. In other words, within any region of memory, the different entities are going to differ very little in their most significant address bits. Therefore, using the most significant address bits does not seem like a good idea. In the special case of small programs, it would be the case that pretty much everything would index into the same place in the hash table. They would have the same hash function and therefore it is not a good idea to uh, use the most significant bits for the fast cache lookup. Okay, so um, the second alternative that we were to, uh, going to take into account was using the least significant bits of the address. Okay, now let us think about this a little bit. The idea is that we will rather than using the most significant bits, we have eliminated this as being a good idea, but rather we could use some of the least significant bits of the address. This is the address A we are talking about. 
to index into the cache directory in order to do the lookup to determine if it's in the cache or not. Okay, now let's think about the least significant bits a little bit. So once again, we'll look at a picture of the memory image and let's consider uh, a particular, this is the address A that I'm concerned about. And I know that address A has some address, but uh, this could be the address. I'm, I just, I'm just putting down some, this is not a 32-bit address, it's only a 16-bit address. And I've, in red, I've shown you the least significant bits of the, of the address A. Now, we know that from the perspective of spatial locality of reference, we know that in connection with address A, some of the addresses which are important in terms of likely ref addresses which will be referenced in the near future are the neighbors of A. And what are the neighbors of A? The neighbors of A are the memory locations which are A minus 1, A minus 2, A plus 1, A plus 2, etc. And if I look at the addresses of the neighborhood of A or the neighbors of A, I've put them down over here, you notice that the addresses of the neighbors of A are actually similar to the address of A in their most significant bits. And in fact, they differ only in their least significant bits. Right? You, if I just look at the least significant bits of A and its neighbors, I notice that they're all different. What does this mean? This means that if I had used the least significant bits of the address A to look into the cache, and then next I was to use the least significant bits of address A plus 1 to look into the cache, and so on, because address A plus 1 is likely to be referenced soon after A, then I would find that each of these things each of these objects indexed into a different cache location. Now, in general, we understood that from the perspective of spatial locality of reference, we really want to treat A and its neighbors as one entity. Because if there is spatial of locality of reference, then we want them to come in as a whole into memory. In, in, in the case of paging, we talked about A and its, uh, A and its neighbors should be coming into, ca into the main memory together. That's why we had this notion of a page. The same concept should hold in the case of the cache. We do want to treat A and its neighbors, A and A minus 1, A plus 1, A minus 2, A plus 2, etc., as a single entity. But if we use the least significant bits of an address to do the lookup, then we are treating A and its neighbors as different entities, most definitely, because they will occupy different locations in the lookup table. Therefore, once again, this doesn't look like a good idea, because if I use the least significant bits, A and its neighbors typically differ maybe only in the least significant bits. And the consequence would be that um, they, are not, they would hash into different hash table entries, and this would not be a good idea. So in, in essence, we considered using the most significant bits of the address, we considered using the least significant bits of the address, neither of them was any good. What we're left with is we have to use bits from elsewhere, in other words, some of the intermediate bits of the address for the fast cache lookup for, as the hash function. In other words, when we think of how the cache hardware looks at a memory address, if I consider the address A, once again, I'm showing you the address A in binary. Then from the perspective of, and, and okay, I'm showing you the address A in binary with the least significant bit of the address shown on the, on the right and the most significant bit of the address shown on the left. Then from the perspective of how the cache is going to look at it, the cache is going to use some of the intermediate bits to index into the cache directory because the intermediate bits define the hash index, which is why I refer to them as the index bits. They define the hash function, which is going to be used to do the look into the cache directory. What we are left with is the most significant bits and the bits which are less significant than the bits that were used for the computation of the index. And if, if we just look only at this region of the diagram, this will remind you of what we had in the case of paging. Do you remember? So for the moment, just ignore the region of the diagram to the left of this line. If you look at the region of the diagram to the right of the line, this looks very much like what we had in the case of paging, where an address was viewed as a virtual page number and what we called a, a page offset. And this looks very much the same. The virtual page number was used to index into a page table. Here the index that we have over here is going to be used to index into the cache directory. And therefore the remaining bits are playing very much the same role as the page offset bits were playing in the case of paging. So since I need to use a different term from page, I will use the term block in the context of caches and I will refer to the lesser significant bits 
In other words, the bits which are less significant than the bits which are used for indexing as formulating a block offset where the term block is being used for a concept like the page but in the context of caches. So we'll, I formally introduce the word block as a concept in caches which seems to serve the same purpose as the page did in virtual memory. In some sense it is providing the exploitation of spatial locality of reference. In addition to that it is providing a mechanism by which I need not maintain the translation information for each byte for each address but rather it can be maintained a single piece of translation information can be maintained for a, a large number a region a contiguous block of addresses. So these are the two uh, objectives that the block is going to serve in the case of caching same objectives that are served by the page in the case of paging. It reduces the translation table size in other words it reduces the size of the cache directory rather than having to have one cache directory entry for each byte in terms of addresses I need to have one cache directory entry only for each block. Similarly it causes exploitation of spatial locality of reference because very clearly the cache is going to be organized in terms of blocks not in terms of individual bytes. Right, so the bottom line is we now figure out that from our understanding of how the hashing is going to happen that the cache is likely to be organized with the cache directory having one entry for each cache block just like the page table contain one entry for each virtual page. So we are going to find out that there is a great deal of similarity between the operation of the cache and the operation of virtual memory. So the, our, the time that we spent in understanding virtual memory will be of benefit to us in getting a, a quicker understanding of how caches operate. So just to sum up what we have seen up to now, we figure out that from this discussion about how the fast lookup is done, it led us to this conclusion that a cache is organized in terms of blocks and the blocks are basically memory locations that, same, that, that share the same address bits other than the least significant bits. So they are memory locations which differ only in their least significant bits, in some sense defining a neighborhood around the middle address of the block. Secondly, we would, from our, from our understanding of how virtual memory operated, we knew that the concept of pages was useful for the virtual address space, but the consequence was that main memory as well as virtual memory both had to be organized in terms of pages. The consequence in terms of caches now is going to be that if we assume that caches are organized in terms of blocks, since the data or instructions are going to come into the cache out of main memory, it must be the case that main memory also is organized in terms of blocks. In other words, uh, I am sorry, uh, continuing our summing up, we, we figure out that the cache is organized in terms of blocks, not in terms of individual bytes, but in terms of blocks. Main memory also is organized in terms of blocks, not in terms of individual bytes, but in terms of blocks. And finally, we understand how the cache hardware views an address. It views an address as actually being made up of the central bits, uh, uh, the, some of the intermediate bits which are used as lookup value which define the hash, the hash value for indexing into the cache directory. But what I mean by directory here is the cache directory, the do I have it table which is present inside the cache. The least significant bits formulate a block offset. They tell you within a particular block which particular byte or word is actually ref required by the processor. And then there are the most significant bits which I will talk about that shortly. But uh, given for a particular cache then we should, given details about the cache, uh, the most significant bits we will for the moment refer to as the tag, but for a particular cache, if I give you details about the cache, you will be able to calculate how many bits are present in the block offset. In other words, how many address bits are used as block offset and how many address bits are used as index into the directory. And as a consequence, you will be able to calculate how many address bits are used as, as the tag, whatever the tag is used for. Okay, now moving right along. I just wanted to remind you about uh, something that we had seen briefly earlier about the different kinds of memory present in a computer system. Now uh, in, the, in, in our high level diagram about organization of the computer system there was the registers which were a form of memory. Inside the ALU there were some more registers, special purpose registers. I'm sorry, not inside the ALU but inside the control there were some more registers. Even inside the ALU there were some special purpose registers such as ALU out conceivably. Then the cache is a form of memory, main memory is a form of memory. In addition to that many of the I.O. devices are a form of memory such as the hard, hard disk or VCDs, DVDs and so on. 
and uh, I won't say much more about the IO device memory which are often referred to as secondary storage. Once again I will defer discussion of that for until a later lecture. But what we have seen about the different kinds of memory that I have sublisted, in other words registers, cache and main memory is that these are all made out of circuits that can remember things. They are made out of ele electrical circuits, digital circuits that are capable of remembering things. And the way that the circuits remember is either by the state of a circuit, the circuit, some of these circuits are known as flip flops. So people talk about the state that a flip flop is in. Flip flop is the name of a particular kind of circuit capable of remembering. Alternatively, the circuit might remember by the amount of charge stored in a capacitor. So there are different kinds of uh, circuits that could be used in registers, cache and main memory. But in both cases, the information that is stored will be lost when the power source is turned off. In other words, when you turn off the computer, the contents of the registers, the contents of the cache, the contents of the main memory are all lost. Why? Because the circuits that are used in the registers, the cache and the main memory all depend on there being power available. And they keep on remembering either by the state a circuit is in or the amount of charge stored. And when the power is turned off, the charge dissipates and the state that the circuit is in disappears because the machine is in a non-powered up state and therefore the information is lost. This is of course not the case with the hard disk, the CV, DVD and so on fortunately. But for the moment we understand that when these are, these are the kinds of circuits which from which the information is lost when power is turned off. And basically these circuits, uh, uh, the, the registers, cache and main memory are all, will all be made of potentially different kinds of circuits, but the different kinds of circuits will all contain a sub-circuit or a very simple version which is capable of storing one bit of information and then that kind of circuit would be replicated a large number of times in order to, cre to create adequate storage for the, require the requirement. For example, if I am talking about one 32-bit register, then there might be a, a, a simple circuit which, is, which can be used as a one-bit register and I have 32 of them together which forms a 32-bit register. Similarly, in the case of main memory, the, the, the scale would be much larger. There could be gigabytes of information that have to be stored and therefore grow, uh, much larger replication of the, the sing, simple circuit which could remember one bit. Okay, now, uh, one term which is used in connection with main memory and which I have also used in this class is to talk about RAM, RAM. I use it in this very lecture because when I talked about, uh, when I replaced, when I gave you the block diagram of cache and I started by saying cache has fast memory but then when I went into a technical mode, I replaced the word fast memory by cache RAM, R-A-M. And I never told you what R-A-M was. And further, those of you who have read advertisements or for, for computers, you may have come across the term RAM there. For example, an advertisement which says that this particular uh, personal computer is provisioned with two gigabytes of RAM. What does RAM stand for? RAM actually is an uh, acronym for random access memory. So it's a form of memory and the form of memory has a property of something called random access and let me just give you a rough idea of what it means to be random access. Essentially what a random access memory is, a kind of memory which is able to handle arbitrarily ordered requests without favoring any particular request. In other words, as far as RAM is concerned, each memory access is equivalent to each other memory access. Memory accesses are not in any sense, pr pr one memory access is in no sense prefer preferred over another memory access in terms of getting preferential treatment. Right? So that's essentially what RAM could mean. But we just understand that when one hears about RAM, it is a form of circuitry which remembers and has the property that it, uh, this property in some sense. Right? And we understand that the, 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 the memory inside the cache is likely to be of this kind as well. Okay, now I would like to introduce one more term before getting into the nitty gritty details of cache and this term is memory hierarchy because uh, we have seen many different kinds of memory in our quick look back at computer organization starting from the CPU registers to the cache memory to the main memory and even the secondary storage like disk or DVD and very clearly they all form some form of storage within the computer system. They can all be used to store information within the computer system. And I'm shortly going to explain why I use the word hierarchy. But let's just 
refresh our memories about how these different forms of memories differ from each other. Now, one way in which they differ from each other, or let's just spell out the properties of each of these. What do we know about CPU registers? We know that there are typically a small number of CPU registers. For example, in the MIPS-1 instruction set, we found out that there were 32 integer registers and 32 general purpose registers. So the number is on the order of 16 or 32 or 128, a few tens or a few, at most a few hundreds of CPU registers. But we did know that they could be accessed in a very small amount of time. We used our definition of the clock cycle based on how fast one could access a CPU register. And the assumption was that a CPU register could be accessed in much less than a clock cycle, which is why I talk about sub-cycle access time. It takes less than one clock cycle to access a register. So it's on the order of less than a nanosecond. Now, we haven't learned a lot about cache memory, but uh, we do know from the way that I've been drawing things and from comments I made in the previous lecture that the cache memory has to be viewed as being part of the processor. So if there is, the processor is on one uh, integrated circuit chip, then the cache memory is likely to be on the same integrated circuit chip. It's integral with the processor. I've already mentioned that the typical size of the cache is something like 32 kilobytes. So let's just generalize that to a few tens of kilobytes. And in the extreme case, there may be caches with a few megabytes, but this is a reasonable generalization. Just as I generalize CPU registers as being a few tens in numbers, I could talk about the cache memory as being of size a few tens of kilobytes. 32 kilobytes is the number which we have in mind as a typical cache. And we have this understanding that the access time of a cache memory is likely to be maybe a cycle. Uh, until now, our assumption was that the access time of cache memory was one cycle. I've now extended that a little bit. It might be one, uh, more than one cycle. It could be two cycles or something like that. But we're talking about something which once again is on that nanosecond time scale, maybe one nanosecond, maybe two nanoseconds. Registers were a fraction, a, a part of a nanosecond. What do we know about main memory? We know that main memory is much larger. We could be talking about a few gigabytes, two gigabyte main memory in the advertisement that I referred to in the previous slide. You may be fortunate to have four gigabytes of main memory in your PC at home. Others may be less fortunate and have only uh, half a gigabyte, or 512 megabytes of main memory. And from what we've seen, the access time is several tens of cycles, maybe 100 nanoseconds or, or thereabouts. Finally, store, secondary storage like disk, we do know that uh, I've talked about disks which could have hundreds of gigabytes or even a few terabytes of capacity and that the access time is not nanoseconds, at, you know, not on the nanosecond time scale at all, but in fact on the millisecond time scale. So th these are numbers that we have encountered until now. I've ma I'm making only minor adjustments to that. The, the kind of minor adjustment is that there may be caches which take more than one cycle to be accessed. Other than that, it's pretty much the same numbers that we've been talking about before. So now if I had to actually represent this information on a single diagram, the way to represent that diagram might be in the form of a triangle. And the general idea is that if I wanted to represent both all of, all of registers, cache, memory, and secondary storage devices on a single diagram, I would give very little importance to registers because there are so, the registers provide so little storage. They may only be 32 registers. Each of them might be able to contain only four bytes of information. That's just 128 bytes of information as opposed to the cache, which can store 32 kilobytes of information, or the main memory, which can store four gigabytes of information, or the disk, which can store one terabyte of information. So the registers occupy a very small amount of the area of this triangle. The main memory being in that gigabyte capacity occupies a reasonable amount of the area, whereas the secondary storage occupies the bulk of the area. And if one had to scale this properly, the line for main memory would be much further up, but this will give us a little bit of clarity in the description. Now, what are we talking about in this diagram? It looks like the area occupied relates to the capacity of the device. But if you look at the diagram from another perspective, we realize that at the top we have the registers, which can be accessed in sub nano uh, sub cycle in between there's the main memory which takes tens of cycles at the bottom there's the secondary memory which takes potentially thousands of cycles so in some sense if i had to draw a line over here which talks about the amount of time that it takes to access something from that kind of memory then the access time increases as i go down the access time increases as i go down the 
down this triangle. Registers are very fast, memories are less fast, secondary memory is the le least fast, therefore the access time is increasing. By the same token, the capacity increases, the size or capacity as I go down this diagram. That is why the diagram serves a purpose. Now given the diagram, we can sort of fit the cache memory into this diagram. We would put the cache memory somewhere over there, towards the top in that it has much faster access time than main memory, but slower, marginally slower than registers. And it has larger capacity than the registers, but much, much smaller capacity than the main memory. Hence, this is the kind of diagram we would end up with, a diagram which gives us this idea about the, the differences between the capacities and the speeds or access. If I had to draw an arrow for speed, the arrow for speed would be in this direction, increasing speed as I go up the hierarchy. Registers are the fastest, cache memory is the second fastest, and so on. So this, this kind of a diagram is useful. It's, we're still not clear as to why it is labeled with the word hierarchy, but very clearly this kind of a diagram will be useful for us in understanding the interplay between the different components of the different kinds of memory in a system and we know that there is significant interplay. Recall that when we talked about virtual memory, we realized that we were talking about the use of main memory, but since main memory was not big enough to hold the virtual address spaces of all the processes which might be running, we had to resort to secondary memory to actually store the virtual address spaces of all the processes and then at any given point in time, some number of pages from those virtual address spaces would be present in the main memory. So there was an interplay between main memory and secondary memory from the perspective of virtual memory. We are now talking about cache memory and we realize that what the cache memory is containing in its cache RAM is some blocks out of the many blocks that are present in the main memory. And not all the contents of main memory can be present in cache memory at a given point in time, given that the cache memory is so much smaller than the main memory. So once again, we are talking about an interplay between the cache memory and the main memory in terms of what happens from the perspective of what, hap uh, what happens when, a, when the processor initiates a request to access something out of memory. The request could be made to the cache memory. The cache memory might provide the data or instruction. Alternatively, it may be determined that the data or instruction is not in the cache, in which case it will have to be fetched from the main memory into the cache memory before it, it can be given to the processor from there. And this is similar to the relationship that we saw between the main memory and the disk. When the processor generated a request and it went to the main memory, the way that we discussed it when we were talking about virtual memory, if it was determined that there was a page fault, then the request had to be satisfied by copying the page from the disk into the main memory before the data could be accessed in main memory and provided to the processor. So the interplays between these different levels of memory present in a computer system is clearly integral to understanding what happens when our program executes and we do need to understand how the hierarchy word fits in and we will proceed to do this in the next lecture. So I will stop here for today. In today's lecture, you will recall that we have started looking at uh, the operation of cache memory. Cache memory is an integral part of any computer system. It was, as we now, as we had uh, found out, the basis for our understanding of how a processor works. Without the presence of cache memory, the, our understanding of processors would conceivably have to be quite different because any time an instruction or a data had to be fetched from main memory, there would be inordinate delays. And therefore, the cache memory is an integral part of the processor. In today's lecture, we have looked at how cache memories, even though they are small, can be built to, to, to do very fast lookup or in fact as a consequence of being small can be built to do very fast lookup in order to determine which of the few main memory blocks are actually present in the cache and we proceed to look at other intricacies of cache hardware in the lectures to come. Thank you.